Hello, and thank you for inviting us to wherever you are today. I'm Dallas, the media pastor here at The England Place, and I'm excited to be with you guys today because today, ladies and gentlemen, our lead pastor, Scott Etheridge, is back at the microphone to bring you guys a great word as we begin a conversation about the Holy Spirit. I'm excited about it today. Uh, a, Pastor Scott's going to be bringing you guys a fantastic update about uh, Pastor Tanya, but also um, we're on the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The very, the eve, if you will, of a really exciting event that's taking place here at The Healing Place. I'm so excited that Pastor Scott's talking about the Holy Spirit and the empower of the Holy Spirit and what it means. And at the same time, we're preparing to do a kids camp here on campus called Hero Academy, where we got kids going to be on this campus for three days straight, and we're going to be loving on them. We're going to be sharing the gospel with them, sharing with them about Holy Spirit. And I'm doubly excited because I have the opportunity to help lead our teenagers who are going to be leading teams of kids. All this week, our teenagers have been on campus, and we've been having some fun with a film school. They've been learning about doing sex. In fact, they're in the room right now. They're the ones operating the camera, the lighting, the, the audio and everything. They're doing weird dances behind the camera for some reason. It's fantastic. I love it so much. They're pointing at each other right now. And then during this message, Pastor Scott's going to be uh, referencing them a couple times also. He, uh, it's It's it, this is actually kind of different because he had a live studio audience, and it's kind of fun. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but God is moving powerfully here at the Healing Place, and there's something amazing that's going to take place this next week in our kids. And if you'd like to help uh, uh, support that financially, visit our website, thpstreetport.com, and go to Giving Page. Just type in Hero Academy for the online giving portion. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into today's conversation. Hey there, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me to wherever you are today. Listen, it's been a while since I've been in this setup. It's been a while since I've been able to bring you the word and uh, so honored and privileged today to wherever you are, maybe you're on vacation, maybe you're on the beach, maybe you're in the kitchen, wherever you are today, we're just so thankful that you've allowed us to get into your space today. Hey, number one, I just want to give you a quick update. I uh, just took Miss Tanya today to her follow-up appointment after her second surgery on her leg and uh, everything's healing well. She's still got uh, some therapy and several things to do, um, several months, uh, but thankful that you guys have been praying for us. Uh, so thankful for that. And just, man, all the people have been just absolutely amazing, uh, food and prayers and calls and all those things. And uh, I know as a pastor and sometimes leading for almost 30 years in the body of Christ, I think what can happen is sometimes you can take the body of Christ for granted. And you can forget what it's like not to have that, not to have that community. As imperfect as it is, as imperfect as we all are, you know, a lot of people look at the imperfections of quote unquote church and they allow those imperfections to keep them from the eternal benefits of biblical community. And I will tell you that being on the receiving end, which is not normal for me and Tanya, we're normally the ones going into the hospitals. We're normally the ones, you know, leading the charge. It's been really interesting. You know, I haven't been in church in a couple of weeks, just taking care of with Tanya. And we were just talking the other day and we were talking about, man, like, how do people do it? Like, how do they do it? How do they do it without Jesus? And then how do they do it with maybe they know Jesus, but it's really not a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And they don't have the body of Christ. Like, how do people survive? And I, for one, as imperfect as it is, I'm just telling you, these, this moment in our lives has just further resolved in my heart how important the local church is, how important the local body is to the oldest, to the youngest. And it has been, uh, it has been painful, it's been hard, it's been intense, but it's been beautiful all at the same time. So thank you for all the prayers and everything that you have done for us. Uh, also, I want to encourage you in your giving. Listen, our giving is just super important just for our own hearts. But listen, in the summertime, you know, sometimes church leadership, they, they say, hey, the summer slump is coming. It's almost like we're trying to get ahead of it. And we're almost saying, hey, because people are going to be doing all these things in summer, people aren't going to give and all of this. And in the church world, summertime, sometimes the most goes out because you got camps and you got all these things going on. Listen, I don't believe we have to have a summer slump. You know, last week, I think it was last week, I just told Tanya, I was like, listen, the last, one of the last things I said in church was we're not going to have a summer slump. And I said, then all of a sudden you break your leg. We're not going to Scotland. All this stuff is happening. Like 
air conditioners are going out at the church, like, like rain floods. We're having all this stuff. Like what in the world is going on? And I was like, I feel like we need to double give this week. So we did not to wave it in the air, but just as saying, you know what, man, the enemy's trying to come against the last words that I spoke to my tribe. He's trying to come against that and bring doubt and bring fear. And we're going to respond and we're going to respond with finances. We're going to double give, man. We're going to give to this. We're going to give to this. We're not going to eat jambalaya, but we're going to give to it, man. Like, like we are going to respond to the Lord, but we're also going to respond to the attack of the enemy and say, no, 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 you're not, get, you're not going to get in this space. And so uh, I just want to encourage you guys just in your giving and your tithe, your offering and all the different things. And we have so many camps coming up and all kinds of cool things that God has really uh, given us the honor to be a part of. So let's get into the word today. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read quite a bit right off the bat, and then we're going to add some other scriptures later on to give a little bit more context. But today, we want to answer the question, what is Pentecost? Now, when you hear that word Pentecost, maybe you're not from church, and you've never heard that before. Maybe some of you are from the church world, and you're like, oh yeah, Pentecost, isn't that where you wear this, or you wear this, or you wear that? No, that that's not what we're talking about today. We are talking about what the genuine definition of Pentecost, biblically, is the definition of Pentecost. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, there it is right off the bat. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound. Now listen, if you're taking notes or you're in the chat, just put an emoji, put whatever in the chat right now just to remind you, sound. It's going to be important. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. Sound, because we're going to see that there are some phenomena happening in the midst of the Holy Spirit coming. There are certain things that are happening that people can actually see, they can hear, they can feel, they can touch. There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. One version says like uh, a, a, a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. So imagine you're, you're there, yeah, Jesus is gone, you're waiting for the Holy Spirit, but you were not sure who the Holy Spirit is. Maybe it's another guy. They weren't sure who the Holy Spirit was. All they knew was that, hey, there's a comforter, there's a counselor, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's like, okay, who is this person? And all of a sudden you're in one place, you're, you're ready to celebrate the feast, you're ready to celebrate, and all of a sudden now there's this sound of a mighty rushing wind that fills the house. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire, write that down, tongues, again, sight, sound, tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. So there was a, a, a literally a tongue of fire upon every single head. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages, other versions say began to speak in other tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthenians and Medes and Amalites and people from Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and the province of Asia and Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. And aren't you glad you didn't just have to read all those names, right? And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They ask each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Many versions say all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy and will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs of the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke, and the sun will become dark and the moon will become blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord's arrival. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What an intense scene. So we've got like sound, we've got sight, we've got crowds, we've got accusation, 
You know, we got these accusations. These people are drunk. Like, what's going on? These people are drunk. Like, what, what is happening here? And he is like, no, these people are not drunk. This was prophesied. Listen, this week represents one of three great feasts of the Lord that, that are celebrated each year by Jews and recognized by Christians as Jesus fulfilling. There is the first great feast, Passover, which many of you might might equate to, quote unquote, Resurrection Sunday. So you have this time of Passover. Then there's the last great feast in the fall, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And in between, we find this feast called Shavuot. It is also called the Feast of Weeks. It is called the Feast of First Fruits. It is commemorating the giving of the law, but also the very first harvest. So it commemorates the giving of the law, but also the very first harvest. So here they are in this feast. Now, Passover. We know that Jesus fulfilled Passover. He was the Passover lamb. Tabernacles will one day be fulfilled. Why is that? Because we will tabernacle in the presence of God forever. And then we have Pentecost. So if you look at all of these in a timeline, guess where we're living right now? We're living between Pentecost and Tabernacles. We're literally in the summer wilderness, heading where? To the promised land. There are so many types and shadows in the feasts. The feast of Pentecost or Shavuot would be seven weeks after Passover. In the Greek, Shavuot translates Pentecost, which is what? 50. It means 50. The Holy Spirit 50 days after Passover. And then following the Hebrew calendar, that would make today, at the release of this, it would make this Pentecost Sunday for us. Now, I know that some others have celebrated Pentecost Sunday in May, and they were kind of going with the Gregorian timeline, 50 days after Passover. But for us, we're just kind of looking at the Hebrew calendar, and, and we're looking at the fact that this week, actually, is the week of Shavuot, which would make this Pentecost Sunday for us. And today, when we talk about what is Pentecost, today is much more than what the Holy Spirit did. It's about what the Holy Spirit is doing and wants to do today. So what happened on that day in Acts 2? Now, I'm going to say a couple things that maybe some of you that are in charismatic circles, you may be like, whoa, wait a second, I can't believe he just said that. And maybe if you're not, you're probably going to go, whoa, wait a second, did he just admit that? I'm not going to admit anything. I'm going to say what the truth is, okay? Biblically, what the truth is. First, it was a singular phenomenon. There are too many people in too many camps that look at the, at the, at the day of Pentecost and say, oh, that's going to happen over and over and over again. No, no, no. It was a singular phenomenon. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jews first at the feast. Why is that so important? It's historically unique. It fulfilled ancient prophecies that the Holy Spirit would be to the Jew first, then who? The Gentile. To the Jew first, then the Gentile. So this was a singular phenomenon. However, and I want you to hear me, the effects of the Holy Spirit outpouring have and will be present throughout all of history. So we have this sound like a mighty rushing wind. The Greek word for spirit is also the word for wind and breath, which are reoccurring signs of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 37. But we do not expect the sound of rushing wind every time someone receives the Holy Spirit. Like when somebody's receiving the Holy Spirit, I'm not going, okay, where's the mighty rushing wind? Where's the mighty? I got to hear the sound of the mighty. No, no, no. That was a singular phenomenon. In that moment, likewise, tongues as of fire appeared and rested on each one of them. Why is this important? Because under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit ministered to the crowds, but the Holy Spirit would sit upon selected individuals. And most of the time, they were kings, priests, prophets. There were moments that were beyond that, but it was pretty much singularized too: kings, priests, and prophets. But in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit shows up at specific times upon group, but fills, doesn't just sit upon, fills every believer in Jesus Christ. Peter quotes the prophet Joel that the Holy Spirit will pour out on all flesh. And here's the encouragement to you. Here's the encouragement to me. Here's the encouragement to the students that are sitting in this room right now and encouragement to all of us right now is that the Holy Spirit will pour out on all 
flesh, not just kings, not just prophets, not just priests, not just people who look the part, not just people who sound the part, but every child of God, men, women, young, old, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, all flesh. And it appears that flames of fire, and this blows my mind, were literally in the shape of a tongue and rested upon the heads of each person. Now imagine, the Holy Spirit comes in the room, there's this earth-shattering sound of rushing wind, and then all of a sudden you look up and go, oh, wait a second, what's that above Dallas's head? Is that a tongue? And it's on fire. Imagine the scene, like, how can you not stop and just freak out for a second? Like, there are literally tongues of fire above people's heads. And it was a sign of God's presence. It was a sign of the gift of tongues that was to follow. Two sensory phenomena, sound and sight. A one-time occurrence marking the Holy Spirit's arrival. Two sensory phenomena uniquely tied to the day of Pentecost. But here's what we have to keep in mind. God can and will do whatever he wants to do to confirm his presence and lead people to himself. If you were to ask me the different times that I've really seen the Holy Spirit just move in a place, uh, the Holy Spirit fill people, I have seen a lot of things. I have heard things that I couldn't explain. I don't know if it was a mighty rushing wind, but I can remember being in Moldova, a country between Romania and the Ukraine. And I can remember being in this meeting and these people had not experienced the power of the Holy Spirit like this. And the Holy Spirit began to fill people. And people who couldn't speak English were speaking English. I heard it with my own ears. I mean, that'll freak you out. You're used to speaking in tongues being some other language other than your own. But when you hear it in your own language, it'll set you back. And I began to hear. And then all of a sudden, I heard this sound like fill the building. I was like, where's the train? Where's the train? Where's the train? There was no train. Like, it's sunny outside. Why isn't there a storm? It sounds like lightning. It sounds like thunder. What is happening? It was the Holy Spirit had visited this place and these people in such a way that there was a sign. There was a sound, but there was also sight, which was watching people with their own mouths open up and speak a language that they did not know. God will do and can do. Here's the problem we get into, and a lot of people get into this today. Just because they haven't seen it, they don't think God can do it. Just because they don't believe it, they don't think God can do it. And how arrogant is that? How prideful is it to think that we can tell God what he can do? That we can tell God how he can do it? He's God. I don't care how God does it. I just want God to do it. I don't care how God fills young people. I just want him to do it. If it's at a camp, if it's in a small group, if it's in this room right now, I don't care. I just want God to do it. I want God to move in the hearts of people. I want God to, to, to pour out his spirit into people's lives so that they know him more intimately. Not just so they can go and do a bunch of cool stuff, but so that they can know him more intimately. Here's the second answer to what happened on the day in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit himself came once. He is now here. But what he did at Pentecost, he continues to do among all God's people in every century. Peter tells us what has happened on the day of Pentecost characterizes the last days. Here's where a lot of people get janky on this. Last days. It says last days. The last days Joel had in view in, in the late 7 BC or early 6 BC was that the entire age in which was to come, which was to follow. The last days began on the day of Pentecost, but continues through this age until Jesus comes back. So what is the meaning of Pentecost? Why does it matter? Number one, I do have points today, guy. I got points today. Write it down, mark it down. Whatever day you're watching this, listen to it, mark it down. Scott had points today. It's not just a narrative. It's not just context. He's got points today. Number one, Holy Spirit has been present from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit has been present from the very beginning. The Spirit of God hovering over what's about to be created. The Spirit of God hovering, waiting for God to speak 
waiting for God to move. The Holy Spirit has been active throughout history, but Pentecost was the promised, prophesied outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not just on them, but in them. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is eternal. He wants to fill us today. Number two, Pentecost was a fulfillment of three prophetic words. First was Joel chapter two, verse 28 through 32. The second was John the Baptist in Matthew chapter three, verse 11 and 12. The third was Jesus himself in John 14 and 16 through 16 concerning the other comforter. We now live in the prophetic fulfillment of Pentecost to the end of the age. Number three, Pentecost is not just the Holy Spirit coming, but Christ himself sending the Holy Spirit to the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 32 says, This Jesus God raised up, of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Christ himself sends the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing to me that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This was another evidence of that. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to help continue building the church, the body of Christ. Number four, Pentecost is the birth of the church, the body of Christ. Jesus poured out his spirit, forming his people into a living spiritual organism, the body of Christ, the church. Five, Pentecost is a redemption of, of the Tower of Babel. This one gets me every time. In Genesis chapter 11, there's an entire group of people unified around a goal. They're going to build a tower to heaven. And the Bible's clear what they say. They're going to build a tower to heaven to make a name for ourselves. This would be akin to me as a pastor going, hey, I'm building this church. I want us to put the name Healing Place everywhere in this city. Because we want to make a name for ourselves. Some would call that church marketing. Some would try to use the excuse. Maybe it's not an excuse, but they would try to say, well, we, we've got to get it out there. That's how you draw people. No, we draw people with the gospel. The Holy Spirit draws people. They may see the name of a church and maybe they may pull in, but that's not supposed to be our goal to make a name for ourselves. Because what God did then, God will do now. Because what ended up happening is they all spoke the same, right? They all understood each other, but God confused their languages. The tower fell and dispersed them in confusion through the whole earth, Genesis chapter 11, verse 8. And what happens at Pentecost? The exact opposite. They are waiting for someone, the Holy Spirit, to come down. They're not building anything up. They're waiting for someone to come down so that they can then make his name known on the earth. And then what happens then? Different tongues are poured out. Yet what happens? Everyone understands in their own languages. So you had the Tower of Babel where they're speaking the same language and now nobody understands what anybody's saying. And you have Pentecost where they're speaking different languages and everybody understands what's being said in their own language. And then sending them out, not in chaos and confusion throughout the earth, but sending them out in one accord as the body of Christ throughout the earth to make his name known. So let us give an overview of Acts, why the Holy Spirit was given. You say, Scott, you had five points. I got five more. I just decided today, y'all, I very rarely even do three. I'm giving you 10, all right? So here we go. The overview of Acts, why the Holy Spirit was given. Number one, the Holy Spirit fills us so that we can proclaim the gospel boldly. Acts chapter four, verse eight. Peter was asked, by what power was the lame man healed? Peter, this is a quote, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. He proclaims it. He proclaims it openly and boldly. He doesn't shriek back from it. And I was reading the Gospels, and I was reading in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, and I realized that Acts chapter 4, verse 8, when Peter speaks out the way that he does, it was actually a fulfillment of Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. Jesus said this, When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
spoke to them, filled with the Holy Spirit. And some say, well, it's just a one-time thing. Well, here's what we may not understand. Peter was already filled with the Holy Spirit. He was already filled with the Holy Spirit. But there was a supernatural impartation of power for that moment that was needed. We see the same thing later in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. These people were already filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Don't miss the connection. Being filled with the Holy Spirit and declaring the gospel boldly. God did not send the Holy Spirit to fill you to make you feel good. He did not fill you so that you could just speak in tongues in a church service. He filled you so that you could declare the gospel boldly. Stephen in Acts chapter 7 was testifying to religious leaders about Jesus. And in the face of death, he proclaims the truth of the gospel. It was a special anointing from the Holy Spirit in that moment. Somebody who was already filled with the Holy Spirit receiving an additional infilling. Number two. The Holy Spirit was essential to fulfill God's purpose. Service in the local church in the book of Acts, what did it say about you? That you were full of the Holy Spirit. Serving in a local church to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you would be full of the Holy Spirit, to be identified and equipped and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Paul said to the elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock which Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Care for the church which he obtained with his blood. But check this out. He said, pay careful attention to yourselves, then to the flock, which Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Number three, signs, wonders, miracles are explicitly the work of the Holy Spirit in and through God's people. In the writings of Luke, the word power is almost synonymous with the Holy Spirit. Number four, the Holy Spirit speaks regarding when, where, and to whom. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the Spirit said to Philip, this will mess up people's theology right here. Well, God doesn't speak anymore. We have his word. This is God speaking, so God doesn't speak anymore. They had the law, but guess what? The Spirit is speaking. The Spirit said to Philip, Philip wasn't crazy. He wasn't double-minded. He wasn't hearing voices. He was hearing the Spirit of God. The Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Also Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. The Holy Spirit gives wisdom and guidance for missions. Acts chapter 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Acts 16, and they went through the region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And number five, the Holy Spirit enables prophesying and tongues. Acts chapter 11, and one of them named Agabus, Come on, that just sounds fun to say. Just say it wherever you are at. On vacation, maybe you're on the beach right now. Just yell out Agabus. See if some dude comes walking down the beach to you. Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Acts chapter 10, the house of Cornelius, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit filled everybody. They began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Acts chapter 19, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Listen, this is just a few of many occurrences in the book of Acts and the New Testament, and there are untold numbers that had not been written. If it were so, if they were written, there wouldn't be enough room to contain the books. That word was said about the word itself. Like there is untold numbers not even written if it were you couldn't even contain it all and all through the ages from the day of pentecost to now now for those of you that are like yeah but i i i know holy spirit doesn't do that anymore the holy spirit doesn't do that 
There is no biblical evidence. I need you to hear this. There is no biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit would one day suddenly change what he does or who he is. Not one prophecy said that when Martin Luther nailed something on a door, that the Holy Spirit would change. That when King James wanted a version translated into English, that the Holy Spirit would not change. That when they met in 900... At a council, when they met in 1100 at a council to figure out the canon of Scripture, not one time does the Bible prophesy that the Holy Spirit would change. Not one time. There's no biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit would stop giving gifts, stop speaking, stop leading, stop moving, stop miracles, stop healings. No biblical evidence whatsoever until Jesus comes and fulfills the prophecy of his second coming. Then there'll be no need for tongues. There'll be no need for prophecies. Why? Because we're going to know everything. We don't know everything now. We have the written word of God, but I still don't know everything. But on that day, I will know everything up to that point in history and everything. I will see him as he is. I will be known by who I am fully in him without this treacherous temporary body. There's no biblical evidence whatsoever that the Holy Spirit ever said that he would change. None. So let's land the plane. Luke chapter 11. You guys still awake in here? All right, I'm just checking. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Wow. Listen, it doesn't matter to me where you are. It doesn't matter to me if you're on a beach, if you're in your car, if you're listening, if you're watching. All of that is irrelevant to the Holy Spirit because He's there. He's there. It may not feel like a worship service. It may not feel like a Sunday morning in church. But we don't live by feelings. We live by the truth of God's word. We live by faith. And so wherever you are right now, again, maybe you are on a beach. Who says the Holy Spirit can't anoint you and fill you and empower you right there on the beach? Who says that instead of jumping back in the water, you don't walk down and begin to prophesy to people? Who's to say that you don't walk down that beach, maybe to that person who's had a few too many, and you begin to preach the gospel to them, and they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ right there at Destin, right there at Orange Beach, right there at wherever you're at. See, that's what happens when we, when we take our, 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 our traditions of men, not the word, but the traditions of men, and we allow that to box God in. Then we can't see that happening at a beach. We can't see it happening to a server or a waiter or a waitress in a restaurant. We can't see it happening to this person who's had a few too many. Did you know the Holy Spirit can come on a drunk and they can become sober immediately? I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've seen it with my very eyes. See, that's what happens when we really believe, when we ask and we seek and we knock. Because if I know how to give good gifts to my kids, how much more does my Father in heaven desire to give good gifts to me? Not to make me known, but to make him known. Listen, if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're like, Scott, man, that happened at camp and I was 12 and man, it was awesome. It was great and whatever. No, no, no. I'm talking about filled again and again and again and again. We see it over and over in the word of God. People who are already filled with the Holy Spirit getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? I don't know. For a moment. 
for a specific moment in time that God had appointed. But I don't know. I'm not God. But I know his word confirms it. His word confirms it over and over and over and over again. It's not just a one-stop shop. It was a one-time event unique in history with phenomena that may have been unique to the moment. But the Holy Spirit, he's throughout eternity. He's not just at the day of Pentecost. He's here right now. He's here right now to fill, no matter how I feel. Listen, I, I came into this room directly from seeing something take place in a, in, a, in, a, in a doctor's office room to my wife and then getting her home and, and, and feeding her, getting her into the bed and driving straight here to preach the gospel. I may not feel like God's in all of that, but God is in all of it. God is filling me right now. As I've been speaking, I've been being filled. I'm not just jacked. I'm not just pumped up. I'm not just pumped up to be in front of a camera to pump people up. I've been being filled with the Holy Spirit this whole time. Because quite honestly, I, maybe I haven't been empty, but I'm telling you, man, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. When you walk into a room and, and you see a woman who literally to you is Wonder Woman, she is the all in all. She is the love of your life. She is the one who is leading the charge. She is the one that is always up and going and doing and, and speaking life and laughing and hugging and loving on people and her not being able to do that. Man, that'll mess you up over a few weeks. But God has been with us the whole time, filling us with his Holy Spirit over and over and over again. Not because Scott wants to believe it, but because the word of God says it. Listen, if somebody tells you that the Holy Spirit doesn't do that anymore, you need to remind them that the word of God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost never said he would change. As a matter of fact, it said, was, is, and is to come. He is unchanging. He is unchanging. Ever present and unchanging. We change all the time. Sometimes by the minute second. Depends on how we feel. God doesn't do that. God doesn't change. He's God. And the Holy Spirit never prophesied that he would change because man did something. The Holy Spirit never said that he would change. He is who he was, and who he is, and who he will be for all of eternity. And it is through him that we are drawn to Christ. We are drawn to Christ. The Holy Spirit himself convicts us and draws us to the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So listen, I'm going to pray with you right now. And I, just, I don't really feel like I need to make this a big, long, elaborate prayer. You know, sometimes I think we think that the number of words dictates the power of the prayer, and that's just not true. Man, if I can just get the words right, if I can just get the words right. Students, if you're in this room, you need to listen to me. You need to not listen to that lie. It's not, about, it's not about all the words. It's not about getting all the words right. It's about your heart. If your heart is pure, just a simple Jesus will do. Jesus. Boom. Just like that. <laughs> in a moment. In a moment. Boom. God meets you right where you're at. So, Lord, I just thank you right now for whoever's watching this and listening. And I pray in the simplicity of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, that you would fill right now, that you would fill them, you would empower them, you would anoint them, you would comfort them, you would counsel them. All those things that you said you would do would be evident in their life. You would do those things. You are the baptizer. Baptize, immerse them in that fire that burns away the stuff we don't need. And then you give the water that we so desire, the living water. We're so thankful today to know that although Pentecost was a day, it was a day, it was a wild day, it was an amazing day. But we thank you that that day wasn't about 
Pentecost, 50, but it was about the Holy Spirit being poured out and you're still being poured out today and you're being poured out right now on somebody who's watching and listening who in desperation cried out, God, I've got to hear your voice. Well, guess what? You just did. Not my voice, his. His word. His voice speaking to you. His Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. And I just declare these things and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, may the Lord bless you guys, keep you. Hey, thanks for the outlet today. I needed this outlet. This has been brewing and burning in me for a while. And I just needed this outlet. So thank you for providing me an outlet to just share the gospel with you today. And hopefully you've learned something, but that your head hasn't gotten bigger. But maybe your heart has got a little bit bigger today. In Jesus' name. See you.